In today's keynote lecture, she'll focus on the way that policymakers and practitioners aim at dealing with religious and cultural practices uh, that are related, for instance, to gender roles and sexuality, and which they find problematic. Tackling such pro problematic uh, issues, the government in Norway makes use of civil society organizations, which of course is a part of a larger development also in other European countries. Especially when we look into questions about the governance of religious diversity in general and the governance of Islam in particular. The above questions about governance have been widely addressed by Dr. Thomas Martikainen, who is currently a university researcher at the University of Eastern Finland. He has published extensively and also developed new theoretical insights in sociology of religion on religion in the neoliberal age. He will take the floor after Dr. Lilleve's keynote and give, her comment, give his comments on her lecture. And thereafter, the floor will be open for public discussion. Now, you might have noticed that in chat, uh, Laura Kokonen has put some uh, information of, on how you can take part in this discussion. We have Linga for questions and comments, and then you can ask for the floor in chat of Zoom. Now, just the information that this lecture is recorded and will be published later on in YouTube channel of katsomukset.fi. Katsomukset.fi is a place where you can also find more information about this Argumenta project and, and the previous seminars and what's going to come in the future. Now, very well, welcome to uh, Rania Lilevic and uh, we will move to the uh, lecture that we'll see on the video. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Ragnar Lilvik. I am a researcher here at Fafo Institute for Labor and Social Research in Oslo, Norway. I'm very happy to be invited to talk to you today uh, about this uh, topic I called Addressing Bad Religion. Thank you to Argumenta and to Professor Tula Takaranaho for the invitation, and especially for asking me to um, Think about the statement that the Argumenta project makes, that there is an increased need for religious literacy in our societies. Uh, I will uh, do that from my perspective, uh, from my work in Norway, and also uh, I look forward to discussing uh, with you and your experiences after the talk. So some words uh, about the structure of the talk. I thought I'd uh, address first um, my take on what religious uh, literacy means um, and the questions that I have about this concept. Uh, I'll also try to say a few words about the Norwegian uh, context uh, and uh, what it means to talk about religion as a public concern uh, in Norway. And I will um, introduce you to some empirical cases to make that a bit specific because I'm currently working on a project with some colleagues at FAFU about how politicians and NGOs address uh, cultural and religious ideas and attitudes that might uphold practices such as honor-based violence, forced marriage, and extreme social control and uh, uh, FGM. Um, and I'll look at some examples from the preventive work that organizations carry out um, as part of this uh, public policy approach that Norway encourages, uh, to talk about how different ideas about the role of religion shape the approaches that these organizations take, and uh, what that uh, can uh, inspire us to think about when it comes to the religious literacy argument and some um, dilemmas that we might uh, uh, observe when it comes to how we can promote better conversations about sensitive and controversial topics in our societies. Because why do we need religious literacy? What is that all about? 
uh, as academics, but also as practitioners, citizens, and media consumers, we encounter religion in many situations. And sometimes it looks as straight in the face, and sometimes it's hidden in the structures and cultural traditions that we take for granted. Um, so we might benefit from uh, something called religious literacy if we want to have uh, political uh, but also personal conversations about religious phenomena. But what does it mean to have religious literacy? Um, what does it mean beyond just knowing something about religion? I looked at both American and British definitions of this. Uh, I think maybe it has been a bigger a topic in those uh, academic uh, traditions. But I found this definition, um, which I have uh, compressed a bit uh, from Denham, Francis, and Shaw, that kind of pointed out four uh, parts of what it means to become literate uh, in religious literacy. So firstly, to learn to understand religion uh, as a discursive category, kind of to have an academic uh, approach to uh, the study of religion is what they stress first. Uh, and they also uh, encourage uh, understanding the dispositions brought in the conversation. Uh, and they don't say that we all need to know everything there is to know about religions uh, or religious life or practice. They say we need to be able to identify the knowledge that is needed in, in the specific settings that we work in. But then they also stress uh, that religious literacy takes some uh, more general skills um, that you will need to apply your knowledge in practical encounters. So becoming literal, uh, literate means just the, a package, uh, we can say, of a certain perspective on religion, uh, knowledge about religion, and some more general skills that help you to apply your knowledge uh, in practical encounters. And my favorite argument or part of the argument uh, for religious literacy is that it promises that if we have those uh, competences and skills, we can have better conversations. Uh, it promises that we can um, be better at thinking and talking about religion and then have um, better public and private conversations about religion and belief, uh, which is something that our societies could need. My least favorite part of the argument for religious literacy is that it has an inward orientation towards academic training in higher education. Um, Adam Denham, for example, argues that universities are a good place to start increasing religious literacy uh, because of the formation of minds which happened there, uh, underpinning the conversations in wider society, as he claims. I'm not saying that isn't true or important, but there are very many other arenas in society where people learn about religion, acquire skills that are useful for talking about religion. Uh, I'm not sure the universities are even leading the conversations that we are having about religion. So perhaps we can take the religious literacy perspective and uh, use it to look at some other actors and some other arenas um, where people are engaged in public and private conversations about religion and belief and promoting those conversations. Uh, and I specifically look at the, those that are encouraged through public policy. Uh, I talked, or I titled my talk, Addressing Bad Religion. And as a political scientist, I am most interested in religious issues when these guys here get involved, which is usually when something is considered bad, to put it simply. This is a photo of our current prime minister in Norway. Her name is Anna Solberg, and she's taking a selfie here with her cabinet members. And although Norwegian politicians like these are quite reluctant to interfere with religion directly, issues related to religion are still uh, sometimes put on the political agenda as problems that require collective political action. And that is when public policies are made. Public policies are the actions that a political system produce in attempts to solve uh, those problems that are deemed political or public concern. So anytime uh, a conversation, or we can say, about religion is initiated 
by public policy, there is an assumption at the bottom of it that something is wrong and needs to be fixed. But these assumptions are not static. Uh, and they can differ between those who design the policy and those who implement it. Uh, and I think that's uh, very interesting, and I, I study that a lot in my work, that the national politics are important when it comes to designing policy, but the implementation often happens at the local level. Uh, for example, the Norwegian state delegates so many tasks and responsibilities to local authorities uh, in the areas such as health or education or social, social service. But when it comes to fields like diversity and integration, they also increasingly look to NGOs and civil society organizations uh, as partners in implementing public policy. And they can have a quite different uh, understanding of these public concerns that the politicians want to address. Before we look at some specific public concerns, and policies, I want to just zoom out a bit and uh, say a few words about the Norwegian context uh, and what is uh, a bit special about this context when it comes to learning and talking about religion. Norway has steadily secularized. Uh, it has formally separated church and state uh, through constitutional reform, although late in 2012, uh, and an increasing uh, numbers uh, of uh, people are not long, no longer identifying uh, as Christians as they used to. Now Norwegian non-believers outnumber believers. Uh, and uh, there is uh, an increased uh, or an increasing uh, kind of divide between the native majority population and new immigrated populations, which have higher uh, levels of religiosity. And when we look at um, studies that measure freedom of religion in societies, the Norway scores at the very top. You see here, Norway, uh, Sweden, and Finland are all in the 90th percentile when they are assessed on religious freedom. And a high score in these rankings indicates that for the most part, our populations enjoy the right to practice any religious belief they choose or to hold no religion at all that religious organizations are free to organize and express themselves, and even criticize the government without fear of government sanctions or harassment, and that our laws and government policies do not discriminate against minority religious groups. But this doesn't mean, of course, that religion is no longer a public concern or controversial. Uh, perhaps it is the cause of some of the controversy that we see. And while Norwegians in general are becoming less and less religious in the sense of believing in a religion, they are quite skeptical of those who hold on to their faith. Uh, I'd like to just show you quickly uh, the results of a survey that was conducted uh, in 2019 by the Institute of Social Research in Norway. They surveyed a representative sample of the Norwegian general population about their attitudes to topics like immigration, integration, and diversity. And here we see the results of a question they asked, which was uh, or a, a statement that they put to people and then people had to say if it fit for them or not. The statement uh, had some varieties. Uh, it was, I am skeptical to persons of moderate Christian faith, Christian faith, moderate Muslim faith, Muslim faith, strong Christian faith or strong Muslim faith. And they found this pattern that we see here, that people are more skeptical of people with a Muslim faith than Christian faith, but also that the stronger faith itself triggers more skepticism towards Christians and Muslims. And that even when asked about persons with a moderate faith, some shares of the respondents remain skeptical. Almost two out of 10 were skeptical towards persons with a moderate Christian faith. So these results show a general skepticism of religious persons and then a stronger skepticism towards uh, strong faith and believers of Islam. And the same survey also showed that almost two out of three respondents believe that there will be more conflict between different religious groups in Norway in the future. Why are people in Norway skeptical uh, of religion? According to scholars of religious sociology, 
One reason is that strong faith is often associated with a lack of tolerance towards gender equality and sexual minorities, both when it comes to Christianity and Islam. Here we see photos from the Women's Day March in uh, Norway and also from the Pride Parade, where a couple of politicians are dancing here in the corner. That's the mayor of Oslo and the leader of the Labour Party. And if we look at the recent history of how religion has been presented as a public concern in Norway, the conflict between conservative religion on one hand and the equal rights of women and sexual minorities, uh, which are now strongly held values uh, among the large majority, these conflicts are at the forefront, whether we are speaking about abortion rights, marriage rights, uh, or the right to choose your own partner. And we saw that people are uh, especially skeptical towards uh, Islam. And this uh, points back to uh, some framings of uh, um, conflicts, uh, and, but also more attention to new issues that started since the 1990s uh, that identified um, concerns about gender and familial relations within immigrant com communities, put them on the public, uh, political, and academic agenda. Uh, and then uh, began to um, frame these as uh, cultural and uh, religious differences uh, causing problematic practices or upholding problematic practices. And uh, we started to uh, have conversations about issues such as enforced marriage, uh, genital mutilation, honor killings, uh, practices that were associated with uh, immigrated minorities, where women or children were at risk, and where the common framing of uh, the explanation for the problem pointed to cultural and religious attitudes or values. Uh, and uh, these issues were partly brought to the attention uh, of the public by uh, immigrated minorities themselves and activists. Uh, here we see activist Kada Youssef, who in the early 2000s wore a wire and a hidden camera and exposed how several imams in Norway appeared to support the practice of forced genital mutilation, which then really spurred um, the public debate and also political action. So in short, uh, through activism and uh, increasing political debate and also academic research, um, the uh, framing of these problematic practices, forced marriage, uh, honor-related violence, FGM, uh, has come to focus on the cultural repertoires that uphold them uh, and the um, immigrant uh, communities and leaders that uh, kind of, uh, what can we say? preserve uh, practices or, or continue to, uh, to use them. But also uh, these issues have been framed or the causes of these issues have been framed as something that can be changed. Uh, They're seen as changeable cultural repertoires uh, and often as a, a lack of integration. Uh, and a lot of um, focus has also been on uh, the correlation of some attitudes with religiosity and affiliation with specific religious communities, particularly Islam. And the Norwegian government has, uh, since the 1990s, addressed these issues uh, through a number of action plans for public policy. Starting in 1998, uh, with the government's first action plan against enforced marriages. Uh, and then continuing, addressing uh, also um, forced gentle mutilation, honor-related violence, and gradually expanding the focus. And to implement their action plans, the authorities have since the beginning relied on civil society organizations for their knowledge and capacity uh, for outreach to young people at risk uh, and to communities uh, where experts and politicians believe uh, we need to reshape some attitudes and practices that continue these issues. But we have also seen some uh, changing approaches to uh, 
cooperation with NGOs and the role given to NGOs. Uh, firstly, the question was if the government should address these topics top down or if the NGOs should be more or less just left to do their work with a bit of support because they were the first to address these topics in Norway. And the government early on relied heavily on their work to carry out awareness raising and preventive work among young people at risk and even to run shelters for young victims of forced marriage and honor related violence. But quickly, uh, evaluators pointed out that this should not uh, be the responsibility of the NGOs alone, especially supporting young people in crisis. Uh, and the government has appointed a range of advisors with different mandates and responsibilities in public services, uh, such as advisors uh, that young people can contact in their schools and shifted more responsibilities to the public services. So now we see a combination of top-down and bottom-up approaches. We continue to see uh, that the government has organized and differentiated this work uh, in a separate stream from the wider policy field of violence in close relationships, although experts uh, have continued to advocate for a more integrated approach. But for example, these uh, funds that are available for NGOs that want to work preventively are now advertised to organizations as a subcategory of funds for integration activities. So it continues in a, a separate track. Since uh, 2013, the, the scope uh, or the focus on the phenomena themselves have been widened. Um, in the 2013 action plan, um, the government also included um, work against serious restrictions on young people's freedom as a phenomena that they wanted to address. And this has been renamed later as negative social control. And its broadening scope came because special advisors that had been appointed reported that young people who contacted them didn't just struggle with these narrowly defined issues such as forced marriage or unrelated violence, but with different forms of extreme control that their parents or peers or communities exerted over them. And then uh, experts recognized that these phenomena should be seen as a broader complex and the government adapted, uh, adopted that approach and put it into the policy documents and then the mandates also given to NGOs. But if you look at the mandate given to NGOs, uh, it is not very specific. When the government here uh, is advertising that there is uh, some money for preventive work that organizations can apply for, they say the aim uh, is to prevent forced marriage, female genital mutilation, and serious restrictions on young people's freedom. Uh, but what should NGOs do? They say just uh, work to change attitudes and practices in relevant environments. I would say this is a very open call to action, and it leaves a lot up to the NGOs themselves to define relevant environments and their appropriate approach, the methods, resources. So in our work, we have been working to map and, and kind of study how the different NGOs implement the strategy, uh, how they go about that, how they engage with ethnic and religious communities uh, or authorities in their work, how they try to spread knowledge or change attitudes or teach new skills, and who they reach out to. And there are many ways to categorize the work that the organizations do, but a quick way is to look at who they reach out to, who are their target groups. And we see that uh, most of them target young people um, who they consider to be at risk. Um, most of them people of minority background uh, can be girls uh, and boys. Uh, sometimes separately, sometimes together. Some uh, specifically target young people with a queer identity. Many also target their parents, uh, parents with minority background, but especially uh, recently immigrated parents. And some also target religious communities and leaders or ethnic communities, that those, although those uh, target groups are less uh, common. Uh, and maybe because of the, the dominant frame uh, focusing a lot of this, the struggles that young people uh, have in relation to their parents with uh, what's called negative social control. I uh, want to uh, give you a little bit insight into how these NGOs uh, go about their work uh, implementing this policy, uh, fulfilling their the mission and mandate that they are given, which was so uh, open. And I want to give you three examples to do that. 
And I didn't choose them because they are very representative, uh, but they illustrate uh, the great diversity in their strategies. So uh, after we have looked at these three examples, we'll speak about the things that they have in common. The first organization is uh, an organization for LGBTQ youth with an immigrant background. They target uh, these people um, because they say it's important for the government's mandate, because queer immigrant youth risk both forced marriages and other related violence and struggle to live openly and freely as they are with high risks of mental health problems and suicide. And they set three goals for their work. Firstly, to empower young LGBTQ people with immigrant background to stay independent and confident individuals able to make independent decisions. And to a greater extent, participate in social debates, which the organization feels is important due to a lack uh, or neglect uh, of these voices uh, in debates about forced marriage and social control. And they also want to uh, share intersectional competence uh, with workers in public services. And they want to create more uh, spaces in immigrant communities to talk about LGBTQ issues. But their main focus is empowering young LGBTQ people. And to do that, they use different methods uh, such as support groups, outreach activities, and individual support for young people that contact them. Uh, and one resource they use in this work is uh, link workers. They train their own link workers. Uh, and they explain that this uh, term can be translated as a cultural interpreter or intercultural mediator. And they say that link workers uh, act as bridge builders and fulfill a function that neither public services nor interpreters can fulfill. They are a person who has insight into two or more cultures as linguistic and cultural competence and who promotes understanding between two cultures. The strength of the link worker is, they say, uh, among other things, that they provide cultural explanation through language, religion, and behavioral patterns. And this organization uses link workers as a resource to support young people who contact them for help and information. Uh, and also to hold educational seminars for experts in public services. So according to this organization, these link workers can be these cultural interpreters or intercultural mediators, uh, not simply because of training, but also due to their own background, their experience and competence, navigating different cultures, languages, and religion. And interestingly, the, the same organization also uh, explains that they draw on a transnational religious resource or discourse for uh, the material that they build their work on and pass on to the target group. The resources that I talk about specifically are the queer Imam Nasreddin Gabriel Erami, as well as the Inner Circle, an organization that started uh, in South Africa uh, as a study circle in the house of Imam Hussein Hendricks in 1996 and that now uh, has a, a global ambition of building a Muslim community free from discrimination based on religion, sexual orientation, and gender identity. So they say that they, they work uh, kind of to make this perspective available uh, to their uh, target groups of young people uh, with uh, LGBTQ and immigrant background. And that take on uh, religion uh, it's quite different to the next organization that I want to present, which uh, is a cross-ethnic self-declared humanitarian organization or humanist organization. They have many labels that they apply to themselves. Uh, they uh, say that their organization aims to present a moderate and correct form of the religion Islam. And they aim their activities at immigrated Muslim communities. They argue that they have uh, the specific resources to do so because they have a large network already among several Muslim mosques, organizations, denominations, uh, and they specifically understand uh, these uh, practices such as negative social control and forced marriage and female genital mutilation as something that occurs more frequently among immigrants uh, than Norwegians and among uh, Muslims in Norway with an immigrant background. And because they have a foot inside these communities, uh, they claim they have an access point 
uh, and that they want to use this to invite what they call speakers with the right knowledge uh, from within the religious and ethnic communities to address forced marriage, gentle mutilation, and negative social control uh, within Iraqi, Somali, and Pakistani communities in particular. And then in organized events that drew altogether uh, over 1,200 listeners under headlines such as how to stop female genital mutilation and freedom to choose a spouse. What does Islam say? This organization's explicit religious and even theological approach and use of religious language distinguishes them from most other organizations in our study. Uh, and I thought it was interesting to see who these speakers are that they say have the right knowledge that they want to pass on. And they include uh, speakers uh, who they said can speak about what Islamic scholars and academics uh, and well-known Islamic professors say and declare about the right to choose a spouse persons who have themselves been forcibly married in countries like Pakistan and Iraq at a young age and can talk about uh, what that did to them. An imam who spoke about uh, so-called cultural superstitious values in countries where female genital mutilation takes place uh, and why this has deep roots in some cultures. And health experts with immigrant backgrounds to talk about female genital mutilation from a health perspective. So the main mission here seems to be to separate uh, uh, culture from religion uh, in the understanding of these topics and also to share both uh, expertise and, and personal experiences uh, with communities that they believe uh, may be uh, supporting or practicing these things. The third example uh, of an NGO is actually a two for one example. Because there are two organizations that specifically dedicate their work to people who have had negative experiences within their religious communities. One focuses on Christians who have experienced extreme social control in closed or very strict Christian congregations and maybe left them. And the other organization focuses on Muslim breakaways, dissenters, and so-called apostates, as they put it. And what these organizations both want to do is support those who choose to break out or who want to break out of the religious communities. They say they work to uh, enable everyone to be free not to believe. And they link this to uh, problems such as forced marriage or female genital mutilation and negative social control uh, by saying we need to uh, normalize different beliefs, uh, sexual orientations, and freedom of choice. Uh, they want to uh, normalize the acceptance of freedom of choice over life and body, including freedom to abandon one's faith, to criticize re religion, to not practice religion in a certain way, to go singing, dancing, go to parties, to go to swimming lessons or the gym, to have boyfriends or girlfriends, friends of other ethnicities, to be queer, uh, to not accept forced marriage, FGM, or circumcision. So they, uh, have a very expansive and broad understanding of the phenomena. Both organizations are made up of activists and volunteers who draw from their own personal experience on the subject matter. And their main course of action is to offer networks of support. One organization explains, we get several emails from young girls and boys who say they are no longer Muslims, but have to live double lives under strong negative social control from their family and environment. Those people who lost their faith or will not follow the demands of the family live under strong negative social control, religious and cultural pressure. Most often they feel very alone and think that there are no like-minded people with the same experiences. So these organizations uh, work to uh, offer these networks of like-minded people with the same experiences, uh, but also to uh, spread information to people in the target groups and uh, contribute advocacy in the public sphere uh, to normalize the acceptance that they feel a need for. Now, these three organizations represent very different takes on the same issues, and particularly when it comes to the role of religion in upholding and uh, combating these practices that the government has put on the agenda. And they're also different in how they engage with religious communities or authorities in their work. So the queer organization saw, sorry. 
So certain uh, transnational religious resources or discourses as offering support for persons uh, exposed to negative social control uh, or forced marriage or honor-based violence because of their sexuality or gender identity. And therefore they built on these resources in their work to empower the youth that they wanted to reach. The organizations for ex-believers, so the religious communities that young people belong to here in Norway as the sources of their oppression and wanted to create alternatives. While the Muslim humanists were eager to separate what they considered false information, superstition and cultural convictions from the so-called true theology, believing this would stop parents from oppressing their children through forced marriage or FGM. But there, through all their differences or despite these different target groups, different understandings, different focus areas, the organizations also had something in common in their approaches uh, in that they all take an insider perspective to the issues at hand as they are experienced by the target groups that they specifically try to reach. And they draw on their own experiences, networks, and competences to carry out their work. And then the Norwegian public policy uh, approach allows for these very different interpretations um, between the relationship um, of the relationship between religion and problematic practices, uh, and even funds them. Although the official framing of the policy problem does not support any uh, of them explicitly. And that is a common approach in our secular societies where politicians and public officials uh, prefer to keep their hands clean, so to speak, of religion. Uh, they don't want to take a stance on things such as theology or who should join or leave specific religious communities. And that's why we have such high levels of religious freedoms. Politicians don't want to cross that line. They prefer to address such topics through the means of accommodating and enlisting civil society actors and organizations to engage uh, and give them lots of freedom to do so. So then the result, the actual implemented policy is an amalgam of what the official framing is of the problem and the take and approach of the different NGOs. And that means that when policy encourages education, conversation uh, about religion uh, and creating change, but leaves it up to the implementing organization to um, decide how to do that, um, we have some encounters and conversations um, that we might look at critically from the perspective proposed by the religious literacy argument, if we go back to that. So just to uh, refresh our memories, the promise of religious literacy is that we have, if we have a certain knowledge of uh, religion, we don't need to know everything, but a little bit uh, that uh, is required in a certain setting. And if we have some general competences to translate our knowledge uh, into action, then we can do better work. We can have better uh, conversations uh, about the issues that concern religion. Religious literacy is not just sold as skills useful for academic work. Uh, academic institutions are advertising religious literacy courses to students pursuing professional degrees in disciplines such as nursing or law or social work with the argument that these are job relevant skills that will bolster their professional competence, uh, skills that will enable students to work for social justice, for example. So they are definitely meant to be applied. And the work that the NGOs do is applied work, but not academic work. Uh, it is very much about fostering uh, sensitive and difficult conversations about religion. So there are some parallels here. And we see that the very wide uh, reins that the public policy gives the conversations uh, creates so many different answers to the first three questions here of which conversations need to happen, who need to be involved, and what needs to be talked about, simply to address the same phenomena such as forced marriage or extreme social control. But uh, on the fourth question uh, about the skills uh, required and who has these skills, the organizations uh, share a similar point of view. They stress that it's important that the person responsible for the preventive work has uh, legitimacy and authority in the role of communicator and facilitator of these conversations. And that will vary with the, with the target group and the message who has the legitimacy and the authority. Um, we saw that the 
these three organizations uh, had quite different um, takes on both message and target groups, um, but they shared um, an understanding that persons who themselves have felt negative consequences of parental control or violence can offer an understanding that uh, outsiders cannot to youth, for example. Uh, and also, uh, at least two of them shared uh, kind of a faith in religious leaders and their ability to speak with authority about some religious uh, uh, guidelines uh, or principles or, or perspectives that could help either parents or youth. And from the uh, organization's point of view, it was an important asset in order to reach the target groups uh, that uh, they themselves uh, shared the background and kind of the starting point um, of their target groups, uh, shared some uh, experiences, identities, uh, and across their different understandings of the problems, these three NGOs that we talked about all want to educate. They want to create room for important conversations they believe need to take place. They want to raise awareness about certain aspects of living in relation to our religion, whether they focus on theology or community or the right to leave your religion. And they believe that these certain perspectives can be useful to young people at risk, to their parents, and to the communities they belong to. They claim then also that they have the necessary competence and resources to share these perspectives with their target groups. And they don't mean skills taught in universities. They focus on uh, resources that might be gained through lived experience, such as trust, solidarity, and shared identity, uh, and legitimacy. Now, uh, like I said, these organizations are not teaching uh, religious literacy from an academic perspective or, or it's an academic uh, aim. Um, they are organizations that hold some things to be true about religion from their experience. And they actively try to pass this knowledge on or this understanding on to their peers whom they believe will have use for it. They're not trying to teach someone to learn about religion per se, they try to pass on specific perspectives or resources. And uh, first I thought this is not an academic uh, way of working with uh, religious literacy at, at all, but then I came across the American Academy of Religion's definition of religious literacy. And in their appendix, they introduced something I found very interesting, which is a list of what they call alternative approaches to religious literacy. And they reminded me very much of the approaches used by the organizations that I have talked about when it comes to promoting specific perspectives on faith or theology in their work. And especially these three alternative approaches. The Academy uh, claims that these can be uh, included as vehicles to engage students uh, on religious literacy. And the first one, faith-based thinking, uh, or faith-based uh, teaching, sorry, about religion promotes an explicit belief and or practice of religion. The Academy writes that the faith-based approach advances understandings of a particular faith's interpretations, justifications, and practices, uh, and may or may not offer a critical approach to the religious perspectives given a preference. And I felt that this uh, description fits very well with the Muslim humanist organization that we saw trying to uh, put forward the true interpretation of Islam uh, and differentiate it from uh, what they saw as cultural beliefs. So they perhaps follow this faith-based uh, approach. And then uh, there's the faith-sensitive approach to teaching about religion, which the academy says affirms the importance of trying to understand all religious traditions and practices fairly and without prejudice. Yet it also allows students to voluntarily reflect on their own religious or spiritual traditions as they learn about other expressions of religious spirituality, uh, religion and spirituality around the world today. And this reminded me of the queer organization's way of making an alternative uh, um, theology of Islam available uh, to their uh, target groups uh, of a Muslim background uh, as a different um, religious or spiritual tradition uh, that they could choose uh, to lean on and uh, their own uh, kind of uh, reconfiguration of their identity. 
And then uh, there is the experiential approach, which introduces students to religious traditions and expressions through encounters with religious leaders, practitioners, and or significant holy sites. And the educational purpose of this approach is to provide students with encounters that can ground their studies in the lived religion of people, according to the academy. None of the organizations offered uh, an experiential approach uh, to lived religion, unless we count non-believers. Uh, the organizations for ex-believers were kind of trying uh, to offer an experience of living uh, in the community of non-believers to their target groups. So perhaps you can say that these organizations did uh, apply some alternative approaches to uh, promoting religious literacy, or at least uh, some aspects of it. Um, but then definitely uh, to promote their specific perspectives. Uh, I'm not sure that this uh, American uh, embrace of faith-based teaching will fly in Scandinavia, at least not in an academic setting and even in the public. Uh, we remember the high levels of skepticism that most people hold for people of faith in Norway that we talked about. But then I find it interesting to observe that these forms of what we can call faith-based teaching, they do seem to fly in Norway when it comes to implementing public policy, even on sensitive and controversial issues. I'm not sure if those are uh, examples for inspiration or warning, but they show that uh, some state-sponsored conversations about religion do occur outside of the classroom in our civil society, uh, and that perhaps it takes some special skills or resources to um, facilitate them. To round up, I would say that the diversity of the examples that I have used today demonstrate complexity, if nothing else. And that we still very much need religious literacy in our academic work as students and researchers to describe and understand religion in contextual and cross-culturally accurate terms. But perhaps we can also um, remember these examples and, and spend a little bit of time thinking about the different resources that it might actually take to engage with religion in different types of encounters, uh, specifically when religious literacy uh, promotes or, or promotes uh, the application of our knowledge in encounters. And maybe we need to tone down the promise that if you learn some uh, sociology of religion and critical thinking, then you can apply that anywhere with anyone and recognize the specific advantages that communities at risk often have at addressing their own uh, issues and peers. But I don't believe that NGOs, despite these unique advantages, will replace the need for academic teaching or academic uh, research about religion and the many social issues that we need to talk about where religion sometimes pops up. We still need the academic toolbox to come to terms with phenomena that are so complex and so contested that wildly different versions of reality do exist in the many minds that underpin the conversations in our society. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to continuing this conversation with you uh, in the Q&A. Thank you very much, Aranna. That was really a very clear and concise and informative lecture. I'm really happy that you addressed actually the question about religious literacy from many perspectives. But before we go on, I'll give the floor to Thomas Martikainen, please. Thank you and um, good morning, everyone. I hope you're doing well and uh, good morning, Ragnar. So uh, thank you, first of all, for your uh, very nice talk. It looked at uh, controversial issues, uh, not only in the Nordic countries, but uh, in many places in the Western world, including so-called forced marriage, honor-related violence and female genital mutilation, and, and how there are various state-led uh, processes that aim at 
reducing uh, these, uh, these uh, phenomena. So thank you, Ragna, for this and also for your uh, thoughtful uh, ideas about uh, the usefulness of religious literacy. Uh, just to uh, my my comment is based as a comment, so um, maybe to uh, open some other ways of thinking at uh, the phenomena you were talking about. But I will also have some questions towards the end of my my commentary. So uh, just briefly, how I relate myself to this uh, research area. So you have been looking at, in particular, civil society organizations or non-governmental organizations, NGOs. So I have my, myself studied um, maybe more uh, migrant congregations, including um, Islamic societies um, here in, in Finland. But uh, in this, I have looked at how the welfare state in various ways aims to intervene or encourage these institutions to do certain things it considers uh, uh, um, viable. Now, <clears throat> something that is sort of inherent both in um, today's and yesterday's uh, speech by, uh, by Sabrina Pastorelli is uh, that uh, religion is increasingly regulated around the world. This is uh, based on the research of Jonathan Fox, who has been studying uh, global religious freedom and how states aim to influence it. So we are seeing part of that, even in the Nordic countries that otherwise uh, fare well in, um, in terms of religious freedom and how it is. So, um, Whereas we might not have, uh, let's say, strict um, governmental bans on practicing one's religions, we nevertheless have, uh, have uh, various policies aiming at reducing certain types of behavior that are understood to bear a relation to religious practices. And this is uh, quite a contested area uh, in many respects. Otherwise, uh, something that you didn't take up, and maybe uh, it's, it's one of those things that I would like to um, ask you to in the in the end, that we have seen uh, new constellations uh, in how states uh, try to use or make benefit or support civil society organiza organizations over the past decades. Uh, it might be called as the neoliberalized change on public governance, however we want to call it. But, um, <clears throat> but that is, that is an, another debate altogether, but I will ask you later on if you have something to uh, contribute to that um, debate. An element that you took up uh, in many respects uh, was the uh, role of transnationally spread ideas or um, connections to other organizations working in different countries. This is, of course, uh, uh, an important way how new ideas spread, uh, but it also perhaps provides an avenue uh, that states have less access to, because they have, of course, their own uh, ways of um, gaining international information, so to say, or models of doing things, not least including the European Union, even though Norway is not formally a member of the EU. Uh, there are many respects how uh, EU's uh, or policy changes within the European Union also sort of spill over to um, uh, other, other countries, which I presume include, the, include uh, Norway as well. But first of all, um, quite early in your presentation, you took up the issue of uh, public opinions and how Islam is viewed, uh, let's say, um, particularly with uh, great suspicion uh, among uh, many Norwegians. Um, we do have the same situation here in Finland, um, but it's kind of like how you ask about it. Uh, I was involved commenting a Pew Research uh, Center's research on attitudes to Islam in Europe a few years back, where these guys were a little bit perplexed about the reality that while on the one hand, in this case, Finland was among the 
most uh, negative on uh, general perceptions of Islam as a religion, but when it was looked through other type of questions, including, you know, would you mind to have a Muslim neighbor or these sort of questions, um, the picture was quite different than it was, you know, more on the tolerant side. Uh, in any case, uh, public opinion is is one thing, but uh, you know how much it really matters, because um, uh, the the states have uh, you know a lot of regulations, aims with a long history, including uh, uh, promoting religious freedom. So uh, uh, in my my interpretation in this case from the Finnish case where we see that on the one hand we do have a fairly negative views on Islam as a religion overall shared among the population, uh, still not the most critically viewed religion of all, but nevertheless. Uh, well, on the other hand, I would argue that in this country we have a quite uh, good state of uh, religious freedom um, altogether and a much public uh, support towards uh, various forms of uh, supporting um, migrant organizations to organize and so on. So we have um, a kind of like bureaucracy that supports a certain type of um, multi-religiosity or multiculturalism. While on the other hand, we have a population um, that has uh, its uh, suspicions about the same activities. So there is a kind of like a bureaucratic inertia in uh, in filtering these um, negative perceptions uh, uh, into um, administrative praxis, so to say. So that was kind of like a comment about the role of public opinion, which probably is then in the end filtered through politicians' decisions to uh, do something or react to these uh, sentiments. Now, uh, the second uh, point that I'm making here, if the first one was on public opinion vis-a-vis -vis, uh, administrative reality, <clears throat> are the many forums. So now you talked mainly about how civil society organizations are um, used by the state through funding and um, other things that comes along with it to create a behavioral change among a certain part of population. Uh, I would ask you that how would you relate this into the broader context of how these same issues might be addressed in other fields of policy? And I know this is maybe a little bit off place, but um, a way of thinking that I find quite useful myself is um, uh, the institutional isomorphism thesis uh, brought up by Paul de Macchio and Walter Power long ago, 40 years ago, uh, where they make a simple distinction between three types of creating, in this case, in their case, organizational change, but here we have organizations as instruments for uh, doing something. Well, on the one hand, they have the coercive kind of like the forced model of change, which might in a societal setting mean, for instance, a legal prohibitions of doing something. In Finland, we have uh, legal prohibitions for uh, gene, uh, female genital mutilation, for example. So you're not allowed to do that. Okay, it's, it's, it's quite a clear message. The, uh, then implementing is, is another matter, of course. But I mean that you, you do have certain quite clear-cut regulations. This is not allowed. Okay, then that's, that's, that's one aspect that you really um, uh, didn't take up uh, this much in my uh, listening to you. The other ones uh, that um, DiMaggio and Powell um, take up in their first contribution to this uh, have to do about um, <clears throat> normative pressures that um, while these uh, migrant communities stay longer, they become part of different types of organizational fields that had its own rules and regulations and norms, uh, how you should feel. So you kind of like have a pressure from around which you internalize yourself in order to do that. And this is perhaps one of the reasons why um, the uh, the state is using these civil society organizations because they are kind of like uh, 
um, sharing many of the sentiments, not only for instrumental reasons, that is uh, having money to operate, but also believing that, you know, there is something that, uh, that they're sharing the concern uh, and want to do something about it. So there is this kind of like a slower cultural change because we, of course, know that normative uh, or norms don't change very quickly. So it's a processual way of, of doing things. And the third thing that they um, take up uh, relates to uh, mimesis, kind of like uh, imitation of how things otherwise do what is accepted. And while we do see a lot of mimetic, using this word, um, uh, behavior and action among a lot of uh, migrant congregations, they are trying to kind of like copy what others are doing if they find it um, useful or aim, aim towards such change. So, uh, uh, perhaps there are also interest by the, by the um, government in this case to initiate a change that would then sort of spread along kind of like in a way through their own initiative, creating an input that would gradually then um, create a change among these. So my main point with this, um, with these uh, difficult words was basically to say that uh, particular type of actions aiming to create change within the population are usually only one part in the palais. They, they, they are not the only thing that is, that is done. And thereby, if we look only at them, so do we miss some, some, some other dynamics that are at play? Okay. Now, my third one, to this you refer more briefly, but it's something that I have come across um, both myself and, um, and from other people who have been looking at, uh, at um, how living and uh, trying to operate in a new social context, uh, maybe coming from um, a part of the world where certain practices have not been that usual or have been done in a different way also including these elements that are then um, uh, not allowed in the new um, place of, of, of living, um, that there are these discursive um, strategies that um, migrant activists uh, use. And I also think they are quite um, uh, banal uh, discourses in a way uh, shared by a larger part of population reflecting upon their own situation, which um, delve around the, the uh, binary understandings of uh, religion and culture in this context, where religion is something, in a way, in this context at least, divinely sanctioned uh, and thus unchangeable in its, uh, in its core essence, uh, whereas culture in this discussion is understood as something uh, changing that, you know, um, which may also have some bad sides. Now, especially when we're talking with religious actors, I think this is the, the ordering of these two um, uh, concepts. So through um, theological reasoning or religious reasoning, if you are able to point out that these practices that we thought were part of our uh, heritage and now are now considered suspicions by defining them as cultural, we are able actually to, um, we're, we can allow them to change. Whereas if we put something in the basket of core religious uh, deeds, um, that is then sort of uh, should not change um, in, in, in time. And I think this is a transnational learning process um, as well, where you referred that, you know, if you find the right authority who shares your views, you are able to uh, handle this situation quite um, um, effectively. So um, maybe that is just one comment on the on the transnational aspects of these processes as well. Something that I was um, missing, and it perhaps had not to do, not so much that you have noted it, haven't noted it, but by by the definition of what you were looking at, that if I look at um, migrant activism, or perhaps the word migrant is here wrong, but activism among people who have a migration background in the contemporary Nordic um, 
administrative language of referring to these individuals, that um, there was not much, much discussion of um, of activism, uh, like anti-racism activism, or the sort of racialization debates that have uh, that you do find among a younger cohort of uh, often second generation. Um, uh, people trying to induce change in kind of like the counter narrative. If we have the religion culture uh, dichotomy in a way as a um, as a tool to change tradition, the anti racism, racialization, uh, post colonial perspective are more a challenging way of uh, pointing out to dis dis discriminatory practices. Uh, um, of of the states, but maybe it's not so visible in these particular questions that you have been looking at. Okay, <clears throat> so hereby I want maybe to point out that these uh, processes are um, are never uh, one way. There are always other things, other dynamics taking at place within these broader communities, and so sometimes they merge in um, in meaningful ways. So that was my, so I first looked at um, issues of public opinion, then how, uh, how uh, the, within the state administration, there are different strategies of creating change, some of which you have looked at, some of which were not uh, that uh, present in your talk. And my third point related to sort of um, migrant discourses in, in how to deal with these issues and what type of uh, um, tools you have at your use. So um, maybe you want to comment on those. I don't know. It's uh, you do whatever you want. But I had I had maybe two um, two things that I was um, I would like to hear your views on. Um, First one is that um, beside of that, what you were talking about, do you see any other major policy changes on the way? Because you have been looking at this, so I'm, I'm sure that you are sensitized to public debates in, in Norway and maybe elsewhere that you know what might be um, coming coming forward, uh, you know, in the, in the in the coming years. Uh, and then uh, the second point that uh, do you see that this use of civil society organizations that you have been looking at it that is recent in its history even though in the case of Norway you do have a migrant integration let's say action or policies already um, for several decades is it you know just as how things have always been in the case of Norway or, or are there some qualitative elements in it that make it um, make it different Okay, now, now I will have a small final comment and after that um, we will have a happy discussion, I'm sure about that. So um, <clears throat> in the case over here when we have been looking at um, uh, cultural practices sort of coming together with uh, people from different parts of the world, in this case settling in Norway, we do have a welfare state that uses a combination of both hard and soft measures in aiming to uh, uh, create um, change among these um, uh, populations. And the policies have already changed over the years, which you uh, brought up in your in your discussion. And uh, and uh, here we have uh, the as you know harbingers of the change, the civil society organizations or non-governmental organizations. Okay, thank you so much. I'm happy I had my chance to open my mouth here today and um, looking forward to the debate. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Thomas, very much. That's very really, uh, inspiring. Now I give the floor to Rania. You can answer the questions and, and any comments you have, just be free to say what you want to say. Thank you so much, Thomas. So we're very uh... Uh, good questions and good uh, perspectives that you brought up. Um, and I think I'll just start at the end because um, you asked if this is uh, a recent way of uh, kind of using civil society uh, from uh, in implementing policy uh, in the case of Norway, or if this is something that has been going on for 
a while. And I would say it has been going on for uh, a while, but the way that um, the government is uh, kind of relating to the NGOs in, um, in this policy field has, has changed. And if we go back to like the 70s, then a Norwegian approach to immigrated communities was, was very much to just um, support their own uh, mobilization through their own organizations and kind of leave it up to the organizations uh, for what, what they're mobilizing for. Um, and kind of the idea was to just kind of bring them up to the same level of, of organized uh, participation in society as the native population. And since the 70s, uh, of course, this uh, perspective on what the organizations uh, should do if they receive government funding has changed a lot and it has become much more instrumentalized. Now there's a lot of um, more clear mandates that follow that money, with the exception of religious communities, because Norway still offers um, funding for all religious uh, denominations without these ties. So the, the religious communities are free to do what they like. But the NGOs that get uh, public funding, and they usually have a specific mandate that they should work for that should be in line with government policy in some way. And in uh, this, as I talked about this uh, phenomena that the, uh, the government offers funding to work with are framed as an integration problem. So this whole approach uh, is part of the integration work that the government is trying to engage NGOs in. And the integration approach uh, or the role given to NGOs in the integration approach has also changed in that from focusing on having organizations as a public good in itself, um, in especially the, like the 90s, 2000s, the, the general understanding of the benefit of having these uh, organizations or, or uh, getting uh, newly arrived immigrants active in civil society was more that this is an arena to meet um, across uh, cultural and religious uh, identities. Uh, and the focus is more on the individual participating in certain activities or gaining something from certain activities rather than having these uh, uh, organizational fields uh, per se. And that's also something that we see a kind of uh, uh, a lasting effect of uh, in this uh, work that I looked at today where organizations are enlisted to, to do some uh, outreach, uh, some, um, what can we say, some activism on behalf of the, the states kind of, uh, uh, frame the approach to these phenomena. I, I'm not sure um, how to answer your question uh, if there's an, any major policy changes coming. I'm sure there are, but I have not really. <laughs> uh, maybe you can specify that question uh, a bit more. Uh, and I'm still not sure if I can answer it. But I would like to comment on a couple of your perspectives that you brought up that I, I didn't uh, talk so much about in the lecture. Uh, for example, this comment that this uh, work that the NGOs do that I have talked about uh, in, is just one part of the government's approach. Uh, and I, I definitely agree. That's a very uh, useful thing to remember when we look at what the NGOs are doing. They're only one tool in the toolbox, uh, so to speak, from the government's per perspective. Uh, and you mentioned the coercive approach to creating change and how legal prohibitions are um, maybe the way to, to bring about change in a coercive way. And in this field specifically, um, we can say that uh, the government has tried, right? We have uh, also laws that uh, make FGM illegal. Um, there's now um, kind of work going on to see how uh, the law can restrict uh, this phenomenon called negative social control that we have had uh, more awareness about uh, in the last, uh, what can we say, eight years, nine years. Um, so the coercive approach is also a tool that the government is reaching for, but it's uh, kind of hard to apply. There have been very, very few cases uh, of uh, legal action taken against uh, anyone on the basis of F FGM. So kind of the, the law is there, but the government kind of sees these 
tools as complementary and that they set the normative framework that then they, uh, then they can enlist the NGOs to go out and spread information about uh, and try to uh, make people aware that these practices are not uh, legitimate. They're not uh, okay in Norway. Here are the laws that say it and here are the reasons that the organizations can kind of bring forward. So they are definitely working like in, in tandem, these approaches. Uh, and I also agree that these um, normative pressures are very much um, part of the um, government's approach. I think that's mainly one of the main reasons why they want NGOs to work with them on these issues. Because we know from, from uh, research and, and uh, from the uh, NGOs' own experience that peer pressure works kind of. The normative changes uh, are not that easy to uh, create from like top down. Uh, but if you are in a community of your own peers, uh, you are more susceptible to um, kind of discussing uh, and maybe adapting your own attitudes. I um, wanted also to say something about this, uh, about the public opinion. So I definitely agree that public opinion um, and policy is not the same thing. Uh, and you mentioned that the bureaucracy has kind of a filtering uh, effect. And I think also we have to remember the, the legal uh, context. That there are uh, a lot of uh, laws that protect against the discrimination based on religion uh, and that aim to separate uh, uh, religion and, and politics. So it's not just the bureaucracy, but also the, the legal framework that we have in, in our uh, very secular societies uh, that makes sure that even if public opinion uh, or like there's sometimes public pressure uh, to restrict religion or to uh, interfere in certain practices that are associated with religion, there are a lot of uh, restraints in place that stop politicians from taking action. Uh, and there's, I think that's the reason why we often see a lot of policy proposals that don't make it through to actual policy change or, or, or a change in the laws. Um, but we definitely see that a lot of these uh, uh, proposals are related to Islam or Islamic practices that, that people uh, more often uh, propose something that should be banned or should be restricted when it comes to Islam than uh, about Christianity. I think maybe I will uh, leave it at that for now. So we have time for other questions also. Okay, thank you very much. Does Thomas want to have any comment or? There were a few questions in Flinga, but I, I would say that um, just, you know, what type of policy changes might be on the way? I, I, don't, I don't know, and I think somehow the, there are two other issues that have sort of overridden parts of these processes. On the one, the um, the COVID situation in Europe has kind of like a, stopped a lot of other things um, taking place or making it slower. And then the sort of gradual rise of environmental concerns altogether, I think, uh, may, may play uh, in the basket that the sort of cultural issues, minorities, type of questions may, may become a little bit um, less important than they have been, um, especially um, after the European refugee crisis, where it sort of topped the agenda for a, a long time. But something that I have, uh, which I think is quite important, not it's somehow related to this area, is that there are a lot of efforts to create these um, uh, forms of symbolic uh, boundaries or control if we think of the so-called burqa bans or minaret bans or you know whatever banning this and that's related to Islam. So that seems, st still seems to be making headway uh, uh, currently and uh, uh, they are really symbolic okay you know uh, the actual uh, causes of these policies are um, in, in, in real life outside of the sort of attitudinal uh, sphere really minimal they don't actually change much but they are sort of statements of of uh, you know something but uh, 
maybe I'll leave it to that and you can have a look at the Flinger questions. Maybe somebody will help you with them. Thank you. Thank you. Before we go to Flinger questions, just to inform you, Rana, that the, the keynote speaker from yesterday, Sabrina Pastorelli, is also in the audience. And I think Sabrina could have a word now if you have some questions or comments, just to come into the discussion. Uh, here I am. <laughs> so, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Ah, okay. Um, I I I'm very much uh, thank you uh, for for your talk it was very interesting and thank you also Thomas for uh, your comments uh, very rich and I I can say something about the symbolic policies uh, in a way I, I I fully agree with you because if we look at the burka ban the the full face veil French ban uh, in fact the it is a really symbolic uh, policy. Even uh, we saw uh, on the at, uh, in front of the European Court of Human Rights. I mean the the confirmed yes the the burka ban uh, is uh, perf perfectly legal uh, in a way. Uh, in, um, okay with the European Convention on Human Rights, but in fact there are sort of uh, symbolic policy, uh, especially in the, in the French context, uh, because in, in the reality, for example, for the uh, as concerned the uh, the law on full face veil, um, uh, there are very few cases about that. Or, uh, for example, uh, for the current debate on uh, the new law on, on against the separatism, um, uh, uh, on the on the public arena, they talk about uh, forced marriages or a certificate or virginity or and uh, when um, public uh, when policymakers are uh, are questioned about uh, how many people are concerned. Uh, the minister answered, uh, we, we do not exactly know, very few. So uh, when you, um, at the building of uh, a public policy, uh, at first you have uh, the dimension of the phenomenon, phenomenon you want to regulate. But in the reality, they don't know how many cases. And they said, a uh, few cases. But we don't know about the numbers. So it's, it, uh, it's much more closer to a symbolic policy or symbolic answer to the, uh, to the concern by public opinion uh, than to a, a real policy. I don't know if I say something could be interesting, but <laughs> that's my point. Uh, thank you, Sabrina. Do you want to comment on that, uh, Arana? Yeah, I think it's a very, very good observation that uh, these uh, bans are uh, mostly symbolic and it has been, we have had some, uh, some similar uh, policy proposals uh, in Norway as well. Um, Actually, we do have one ban on burqas, but it's in educational settings uh, only because the bans on burqas in general have not passed through uh, parliament. Um, but I would say they are uh, certainly uh, more symbolic uh, than they are, what can we say, creators of, of change because they are applied so much. Um, and I think that these uh, symbolic cases are probably gonna keep popping up um, we see them now, for example, there's a proposal, I think, to ban uh, the use of uh, hijab for children uh, in Norway. And it's probably not going to pass, but it's another of these issues that will keep coming uh, through the political system. Um, and we also, uh, I think, uh, follow a lot what's happening on the continent often in, in these uh, debates. So now we see a lot of uh, conflict going on in France, we're probably going to see some effects of those uh, topics also in the Norwegian political debate and maybe some new um, policy proposals that copy a little bit of what is proposed uh, in France. 
So there's definitely like a learning effect uh, across countries going on here, like Thomas also talked about. Thank you. Now, Essie, there are some, I suppose, four questions in, in Flinga. I just wonder if you could read them all and then uh, if you're under, you just write down the questions and you can just answer because some of them somehow uh, are more of the same thing, but there's different perspectives. So, so mm. you can answer them all at the same time. So please, Essie. Yeah, I can I can read them. So just tell me to repeat if <laughs> if I go too fast. So the first question was I, I think this was to the keynote actually. So um, was it explained what strong faith means, or did people respond based on their own knowledges? Then there's a question on forced marriages. Uh, what constitutes uh, forced? What level of family social control constitutes? forced uh, the British royal family limit who can be married and with consequences if one breaks the rules often with Asian marriages marriage is often thought as a merger of families with business economic dynamics and there are social welfare dynamics forced has many dynamics um, then there's a question on honor related violence uh, how is this differentiated from domestic violence and uh, finally on FGM forced genital mu mutilation the writer is perhaps thinking whether this is a typo or their eyesight. Uh, how is that differentiated from body piercing or circumcision? Is it just a female directed matter? Thank did you. you get the question? <laughs> yes, I did. Thank you very much. Okay. So uh, I'll just address them uh, as you read them. So uh, the question about strong faith that uh, I guess goes back to the statistics that I showed where people have been asked uh, to respond to statements about people of, of faith or just strong faith or, or moderate faith. And no, there was no explanation. So that's depending on people's own interpretation of what it means to have a strong faith. Um, and the first marriages are uh, in uh, policy um, differentiated from uh, arranged marriages, but the differentiation is tricky, right? Um, so I think that's also a reason why the, the problem focus has now been expanded to include what's called negative social control, because um, it kind of allows um, the government and NGOs to uh, address uh, Practices that can be very problematic for uh, young people to handle, but that are not necessarily illegal, uh, or at least that the, there's some um, gray area uh, that is hard to address uh, through laws. Uh, and I'm not an expert uh, to tell you where exactly the line is drawn. And I think that's uh, something that the evaluators have pointed out is, is quite difficult actually when these uh, more uh, wide phenomena are included in the same basket as the, the strictly illegal definitions uh, or the, the definitions of, of, of practices that are uh, addressed to the legal system, uh, such as uh, FGM and forced marriage. Um, so I think if you uh, put this question to the, the different NGOs that are working in this field, they might also have some different interpretations uh, which uh, I think is very uh, interesting. Uh, and also maybe the, the law doesn't always give you a clear cut answer. Unrelated violence uh, is considered uh, an kind of an under category of domestic violence, but then it is um, dealt with through uh, different policies. So that's kind of the, the, the point I was trying to make that although they are legally kind of recognized to be the same, uh, kind of thing that the, this is a form of domestic violence then the policy approaches taken to uh, combat unrelated violence uh, have been like separated from uh, the general approach towards domestic violence in some ways and uh, yeah i'm sorry about my typo for fgm it is uh, female genital mutilation uh, and uh, yeah body piercings doesn't have anything to do with that Thank you. Are there any questions or comments others uh, than these we have had so far? I don't see any any anything in the chat. Anybody asking for? Oh. 
Uh, does Thomas want to say a word? And we have some time left. Uh, thank you. That's I've 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 said enough. So thank you, Ragnar. <laughs> it was my pleasure. All right. Okay. What about you, Rania? Do you want to have some final words or or? Yeah, maybe since we have a little bit of time, I can address the uh, one of the comments that Thomas made that I didn't talk about before, which is this uh, point about migrant activism and how um, there's now a, a kind of a growing um, emphasis on anti-racism and post-colonial perspectives among uh, especially young migrant activists uh, and how they didn't really uh, pop up in the material that I talked about today. and. And we don't really see it so much in our material because um, we see that the government's kind of uh, framing of how to approach these issues is very much copied, at least in the language that the organizations apply, uh, specifically when they ask for funding, of course, um, but also in their activities. Um, but uh, some, um, when we did interviews or my colleague uh, did the interviews, uh, with some organizations mentioned that they felt this um, this uh, frames were a bit restrictive when it came to addressing uh, discrimination and racism, which they also saw as part of the whole problem complex that they wanted to work with, um, but that were not specifically um, um, pointed out as relevant by the government policies. I think that um, the ones that have most uh, vocally put uh, these perspectives on the agenda have been young female activists that have uh, made a name for themselves in the last, uh, I think, five years, six years in Norway, who have kind of um, broken away from the government's mold of how activism should be done here. And they have kind of um, pointed the gun in both directions, saying uh, we are tired of these pressures that we feel from um, um, ethnic religious communities about how we should behave, how we should act, but we're also tired of being stigmatized by uh, majority opinions or uh, prejudices against us. Uh, and they are very much um, uh, bringing this new perspective uh, to the public debates. And they have been giving uh, a platform also through uh, government action. Uh, so I think through their activism, we are seeing a little bit of a, uh, a change towards that discourse, but it hasn't really been um, coming from the top. It has definitely been coming from the grassroots. Thank you very much, Aina. And, and thank you for joining the argument and, and give you a keynote lecture. We're really happy to have you here. And thank I also you thank you so much for the comments and, and, and Sabrina for being there yesterday. It's pretty we can't meet together in one place and, and, and continue our discussion, but this is how it is. But anyway, I'm really happy that you, you are joining the, the conference and we keep in touch. And all the best <laughs> to your career and future. Now, in the afternoon, uh, we're going to continue quarter past one and with the research uh, seminar, which will be in Finnish. So I hope to see you again after the lunch hour. See you then. Bye.